you were having a little bit of difficulty with the last module, all the logs and the exponentials and stuff. Um, this is a little bit of a break from it because it is something completely different in this chapter. Okay. A lot of the chapters are all completely different. In this chapter, first we have to go to chapter nine, which talks about regular systems of equations. Then eventually we'll get into the, I guess, the entering part of everything and eventually start getting into matrices, matrix, right? Um, and that's going to be in chapter 10. So first I have to talk to you about what systems of equations are. That's going to be the two sections in chapter nine. Then we'll get into chapter 10 where we talk about the matrix, what it is, what it represents, and then how do you mess with them, okay? We'll learn how to add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, square them, um, solve equations using them, solve systems of equations using them. We'll just be doing a bunch of stuff with matrices this last chapter, okay? Um, they actually make things easier. <laughs> so when we go to chapter nine, I have to teach you everything from the beginning, right? So we're gonna have to do everything the long way, okay? Although arguably matrix can be the long way, um, it's just a little bit easier to look at than some of this other stuff, okay? So we're gonna go into it. This whole unit is nothing but solving systems of equations, okay? It's just how you solve them will change in the next chapter. So in this section, we're gonna talk about the um, substitution method and then the graphing method. When we get to 9.2, we'll talk about the elimination method. That one's the one I usually use, but you do have to know of these others because sometimes it is possible that you cannot solve them using the elimination method, okay? Um, you can solve what is called a system of linear equations using the elimination method, but you cannot solve systems of non-linear equations, okay? So as soon as I throw an x squared into the system, you can't do it um, by solving the elimination method, okay? You have to know the other two methods in order to be able to solve a system of non-linear. So basically nothing can have a square root, nothing can have an x in the denominator, and nothing can have a power when you're talking about linear equations, right? And a system basically means you have two equations or more that you're trying to solve at the same time. Not only that, is you wanna find the solution that satisfies both of the equations. So we always know that an equation has a bunch of solutions. You could plug in one, solve the thing, find out the y value that goes with it, and you have a solution, right? Um, you could keep doing that. You could plug in two for x, solve the thing for y, and now you have a second solution, okay? But what we're trying to find here, the solution that works for the top equation and the bottom equation at the same time, okay? And so that's a little bit trickier to do. So it says, um, up to this point in the text, most of the problems have involved either a function or one variable or a single equation in two variables. However, and that's, for example, like this, right? That's an equation with two variables, isn't it? Okay. And we know how to get this and solve for y and then graph the thing, right? Which we will do later. <laughs> However, many problems in science, business, and engineering involve two or more equations in two or more variables. So to solve problems like that, you'll need to do what is called solving a system of equations. The system consists of however many equations you have. They usually use a little brace, little squiggly thingy, to identify to you that that's the system, okay? And so if I had a third uh, equation in here, then I would have a system of three equations, right? Now, the way they work is however many variables you have, that's how many equations you need in order to solve a system, okay? So if you see x's and y's here, then you have to have at least two equations because there's two variables. Now, if this equation was a little bit more elaborate and it had x, y, and z, that's three variables. And so then I would have to have three equations in order to solve it, okay? And we will get to some of those three variable, three equation things eventually, okay? Not until we get to the matrix stuff. It becomes a nightmare to do it without the matrices. So they usually don't introduce the three by threes until we get to matrices, okay? For now, our systems are gonna look a lot like this, although there might be a square thrown in there every now and then, 
okay, in this section. So here's an example of how to solve a system with the uh, substitution. The first thing you're gonna do is you're going to pick one of these equations and you're gonna get one of those variables all alone by itself, okay? Now, typically, if you're trying to pick like the quote unquote easiest one, right? The one that's the fastest to manipulate, you wanna look for, if it's possible, you wanna look for where the Y whichever variable you're solving for. I shouldn't tell you why. Why? Because it sticks out to me. But here you should be looking for the variable that has a positive coefficient and if possible, a one coefficient. So that it looks like there's nothing in front of it, right? It just looks like a plus sign in front of it or absolutely nothing in front of it, okay? And here, if you're looking at these, the top equation and the variable y is the one that fits that description, doesn't it? It has a positive one coefficient. Okay, so that would be the guy that you're going to take and you're going to take this equation and you're going to solve for y. Okay, and it should be pretty easy because I chose it for that reason. So all you're going to do is actually subtract the 2x over, aren't you? I'm pretty sure they do it on the other page, so I'm going to flip. <laughs> so yes, they took equation one. Oh no, they didn't. They're doing something totally different. They're checking answers, which you'll have to do in a minute, but I will flip over there when I need you. So if I take this equation and I solve for y, I like to put an arrow above. That's the guy I want all by himself. So this is the guy that I need to get rid of. So I'm going to subtract the whole 2x. When I do that, I get this positive y equal to 5 minus 2x. Or if you're out of habit and you like to write your x's in the front, you could write it like this as well. Both of those are the exact same thing, right? The two X is negative and the Y, the five is positive, right? In both of those. Then what you do is you substitute that into the other equation, okay? So I'm gonna take this equation, equation two now, and instead of writing Y, I'm gonna write what Y is equivalent to. So I'm gonna plug this in for this y right here, okay? So what does that look like? It looks like 3x minus two, and then in parentheses is gonna go this five minus two x business. I'm gonna finish the rest of the second equation. It says equal four. So all I did was replace y with what y is equal to, right? Then from there, you just solve like normal. So I have a negative two that has to get distributed so the three X just comes down, this becomes negative 10 and that would become positive four X. And then I can combine my like terms. So I have seven X minus 10 equals four. I can add 10 on both sides to keep solving. And then if I divide by seven, I get what? That X equals positive two. Is that right? Yeah. Then now if I want to know what the y value is, I'm going to use that equation that I plugged in. So I know that y is going to equal negative 2, and I now know what x is, plus 5. And I could have taken this version or this version. I just, for some reason, I took the bottom one. And over here, I took the top one. Does it matter? They're equivalent, right? These two guys are equivalent. So it doesn't matter if I use that one over here and then this one over there, it doesn't matter. They're the same, these two are the same. So I get negative four plus five, which is one. So that means X is equal to two and Y is equal to one. So when you write your answer, you're gonna put it in point form, two comma one. And this is what you box, okay? So it's going to be a point. Now, when I get to the rest of the section, you'll see that anytime you're solving a system of equations, you're essentially just looking for that point on the graph where the two things intersect. So when these two graphs cross each other, that's the solution that I just found. Okay, so it's a point on the graph. We will talk about it more and you'll see some pictures, some images of them, okay? Okay, now, for them, they say, let's check the system to make sure that two, one is actually the answer. 
And in order for you to check it, you have to actually check it in both equations. Because it could be that 2, 1 is a solution, but just to one of the one of the equations and not both of them. Okay. So the first thing they did was check it into equation one. They plugged in the two for X, the one for Y, and they got four plus one, which is five. Then they plugged it into the second equation. So X is two, Y is one, you get six minus two, which does equal four. And so it does prove to be true that that is the actual solution. Okay. But definitely, definitely check your solutions. So the process. You're going to take one of the equations and solve for one variable, okay? Then you're gonna substitute what you found in that step into the other equation. Make sure you don't put it into the same equation. If you do, it's gonna get zero, zero, zero. Everything's gonna to turn to zero if you do that, okay? So make sure that whatever you did in step one, you plug it into the other guy, okay? Then you're going to solve that equation. And then once you know that answer, you're going to plug that back into what you did for step one. That's exactly what I did, isn't it? This was my step one, was getting this by itself. Once I did that, I plugged it into the other guy, which was step two. Then I solved for it, and I got step three. And then I back plugged it into this other one, OK? So I plugged it right back into the other, the part from step one. Number four, I plug it into step one. And then that gives me my solution. And of course, it's always beneficial to check, right? So that's always the last step, is to make sure you check, okay? Um, dun, dun, dun. It says the term back substitution implies that you went backwards. First you solve for one of the variables, then you substitute that back into the equations of the system to find a value in the other variable. It's just a bunch of words. Let's see how this works. So I'm not gonna show you this. Which one of those should I be solving for? And there's three good choices here. And it does not matter which one you choose. Solve for y in equation one or equation two? In equation one, because that guy has a positive, right? Whereas this one has a negative, okay? Notice that the x's also have positive one coefficients, don't they? So I could have solved for either one of those guys as well. You have three choices on who to pick. You could have solved for this one, this one, or this one, okay? does not matter, you will get the same answer. And to prove my point, I will do it differently than the way they do it. So let me go see what they do. So they took the first equation and solved for y. So in order to do that, all they had to do is just minus this x over to the other side, right? So they minus this x and minus x on that side, and they ended up with y by itself equal to four minus x. Then this expression has to get plugged into the other equation. So I was messing around with equation one, right? So when I plug it back, I need to plug it into equation two. So they took equation two, and instead of writing y, they're gonna write four minus x. But you always put it in parentheses when you plug it in, okay? So it should have been x minus y equal two. But now it's x minus four minus x equal to two. You do have to distribute that negative. So that's why this x turned positive. And then they combine the x's and it looks like they added four to both sides, right? And so then they ended up with this, you divide by two on both sides and you get this value x equal to three. Then you do the back substitution, right? This is what we got for step one. That's where I'm gonna plug x into. So here's the expression you got from step one, plugging in the three for x, and then you figure out that y is equal to one, okay? So your solution here going to be three for X and one for Y. And it does have to be in the correct order, right? X always has to go first, Y always has to go next, okay? And then I would check that, which they probably do on the next page. Yeah, they just check it into the first equation. It works out. They check three and one into the second equation and it works out, right? Now, to prove my point, I'm gonna do the whole equation again and I had better get the same answer, right? Three, one. Okay, but we're gonna do it in a different color. 
And we're going to pick one of the X's to solve for. So I'm going to take equation one and I'm going to solve for X. So what would I do to solve for X here? Minus I. So then I would have X all by itself and then four minus Y. And so then I'm going to take the other equation, equation two, and I'm going to plug this expression into it for X. So the x right here in equation two is going to become four minus y. Always put it in parentheses, have it. You can decide if you need them later, okay? Now here I don't need them because there is no power and there is no coefficient to apply, right? So I don't need them, but always put them in there and then you can decide. So I'm going to combine my like terms and then I'm going to minus my four I get negative two y equal to negative two, divide by that negative two, and I get y equal to one. So far so good, right? Because I'm supposed to get y equal to one. Now let's go verify if I plug this back into equation one, that I get that three. So x equals four minus the value I just found. What's four minus one? Three, so I get the same exact answer. Okay, so it doesn't matter which letter you choose or which equation you choose. You just have to pick one equation and one letter and get it by itself and then go from there. Okay. Now your computer, because I'm going to teach you all of them, right, all three methods today. So you're going to know too much. <laughs> Because then when the computer tells you solve this by elimination, and you're like, eh, I don't like elimination. I don't like this method. I'm going to use another method. The computer will not know. But when you take the test and I tell you to use a certain method, you have to use that certain method. Otherwise, you don't get no points, right? So make sure that you just try to stick to their directions. Maybe you go do another method to check to make sure your answer is correct, right? But try to practice the method that they're telling you to do in the homework. Okay, don't just do whichever you want to do. Okay, that way you can get that practice in. Okay, all the problems in example one, they were linear, right? Do I have any radicals, any fractions, any exponents over here? No, right? No radicals, no fractions, and no exponents in this system. So that's why they're called linear, okay? However, you can have systems that are not linear. And there's only two ways to solve systems that are not linear. And that's the substitution method we just did and then the graphing method, okay? And we haven't talked about the graphing method yet. So this example has non-linear. Doesn't this guy make the thing not linear anymore, right? So I can still solve it, but whenever you've got those squares or those radicals or something in there, that is usually the one you want to stay away from, okay? That is not going to be the one that you start off with, right? Don't I have to pick an equation and get one of the letters by itself? That's not the one, okay? Stick with the easier looking one when you try to do the substitution, okay? So I'm going to work with the bottom one. And which variable looks like it's easier to solve for in that bottom equation, x or y? Yeah, y, the variable y. Yeah, it doesn't have any number in front, right? So I'm not going to have to divide and then I'm not going to have fractions, right? So I would choose y. Very good. So if we take this guy, though, it is going to be harder, though, because it's not positive. Not too hard, though. You solve for y. Minus 2x. Good. So I get negative y equal to what? How do you want to write that other side? negative one minus two X, that's good. But this is not Y all alone, is it? It's a negative Y. How do I get rid of the negative? Divide by what? By a negative one, right? That way it doesn't change the number, it's still Y, but it's positive, right? And then that will turn to positive one and this will turn to positive two X. And so then this is what you're gonna plug in to the other equation, okay? So notice they took that top equation 
and they put the minus, and they put that expression that I have over there in parentheses, right? Is that the same expression as what I have over there? It is. Both of these terms are positive, just like they are over here, right? They're just reversed. Then you have to distribute this. So you actually get 3x squared plus 4x minus 2x and minus 1 equal to 7. But then these two guys do combine into a positive 2x, right? So you end up with this expression. This is what kind of equation is this? It's a quadratic, which means I'm going to have to get it equal to zero and either factor or quadratic formula, right? So let's move the seven over. Come on, paper. So if I move that seven over, I'm going to have the minus seven. This was the equation. And so then if I minus seven, that's where they're getting this negative eight from, right? And then from there, it looks like they chose to factor it. Fantastic, if that's how it comes out easy to you, right? <laughs> but if not, we can always do the quadratic formula. So negative two plus or minus two squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. And then let's go figure out what's inside that house. squared minus four times three times negative eight. I get 100. Oh, I can take the square root of 100. It's just 10. So there's my two answers. Negative two plus 10 is positive eight. And then negative two minus 10 is negative 12. So you get four thirds and negative two. Is that the same thing that they got? Yeah, so it doesn't matter. If you cannot think of the factors, don't worry about it. Just go do the formula, okay? You do still get the same answers. Now, these are both X values though. This is not my answer. My answer is not four thirds comma negative two. What this means is that the graph actually touches the other graph two times instead of just one time. Makes sense because you have a parabola, right? And then you have a line. Is I gonna touch it twice? Right? Or it's possible it could touch it twice. It's possible it could touch it not at all. Or it's possible it could touch it just once. Okay. Um, I don't even have to put down here, though. It touches it just once. So it could have two answers. Let's go find the corresponding y's that go with each of these x's. Okay. So what you do is you take that equation that we had at the beginning when we solved. Remember that guy? Right? And you plug in the first x value so that you can figure out what that y is. And then you're going to plug in the other y value so you can figure out this corresponding y value. So let me use my calculator. 1 plus 2 parentheses 4 thirds. I get 11 thirds. Now you see where they're getting this, right? And then one minus two parentheses negative two. I get five. Wait. Oh, I put a minus. Is that a minus? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. This is not right. Plus. Now it's correct. And I get negative three. And now it matches that, right? So those are your two points. Four thirds and eleven thirds. And negative two for x and negative three for y, okay? So we got two solutions for these guys. So that's essentially it for substitution. That is how it will work, whether it's linear, or whether it's quadratic, okay? It will still work the same way. The mechanics of it doesn't change, okay? So we're gonna go now to this graphing um, approach, okay? So when you're talking about a system, the solutions of the system basically correspond to the points where the two graphs intersect. Okay, I think I glossed over that, but I mentioned it, right? So here's some examples. Here you have an equation, a linear, and here's another linear equation. And if you were to graph both of those linear equations, um, they do intersect and they happen to intersect at this point to zero. So that point two zero is the solution, okay? 
Now here's a quadratic function and a linear. And these guys actually intersect twice, right? And on the graph, they can tell where they intersect and they intersect at zero, negative one and two, one, okay? And then this was the other case where it is possible that they don't intersect at all, right? So it could be that the line is like way above or if it's going upward that it's way down there and they never actually hit, okay? When that happens, that just means that your system has no solution, okay? So you can go through all of the mechanical work and then it turns out that you just don't have an answer because the two graphs never ever touch, okay? That hasn't happened to us in substitution yet, but it will, okay? They don't want to throw all the whammies at you right away, right? They want you to kind of get used to the process first and then they'll throw in the little curveballs, okay? So for this one, you could even take the exponentials and the logs if you wanted to. We just said nonlinear, right? It could be anything. It could be fractions, it could be radicals, it could be logs, it could be exponentials. So what they've done here is they have these two equations one of them is a logarithmic equation and the other one is just a regular linear equation. And so they drew the log equation and then they drew the linear equation and they noticed that both of them intersect right here at this point, one zero, okay? And so then therefore that is the actual solution to the problem, one zero, okay? And you could check it if you wanted to check it. I'm not gonna bother checking it. Once you, oh, they bother checking it though. <laughs> so you plug in zero for y and one for x. And if you stick that in your calculator, you do get zero. Same thing here, one for x, zero for y, and it does come out. So this is great. Um, notice that it's saying that if you try to do this one by substitution, <coughs> excuse me, you're gonna end up having to solve an equation like this and that's not very easy to do. We know how to do it. It's just not very easy. Um, it gets really complicated. Like I can mess with it, but I don't even think I can get an actual answer because there's too many variables. I could even change this to E, but then that cancels and I get X. And now I have an X in the exponent and X, see, it's not going nowhere, right? I don't know how to keep going with that. If I put logs back in, it's gonna go right back to this. So you can't solve it like that using substitution. So that's why it's important that we have another option like the graphical approach, okay? Now, how do we use this information? Um, we use it a lot when it comes to traveling. I know I've told y'all about that stupid problem with the train going this direction, the train going in that direction. They're both going this one five times faster than the other. Well, when do the trains meet, right? You've heard that on the movies. I know you have. <laughs> they always go, they talk about that one in the movies. Um, systems of equations is how you solve those problems, okay? So when you hear those problems, you should be able to solve them now, or at least have an idea. Um, Another thing that they use them for is for um, business. So there's a bunch of different things. There's cost, which I'm pretty sure you know what cost is, right? That's the amount that, it, that you have to put in to make something happen. Whether you gotta pay for the building, you know, for you to be making your, your stuff in there, you gotta pay for all the supplies, whatever it is, you've got a cost that comes with your business, okay? Then what you have is you have revenue. And revenue is the amount of money that you make, okay? And so when the cost and the revenue are equal to one another, that's called breaking even. So you've made no profit whatsoever when your cost and the amount of revenue that you make is exactly the same, right? So if I have to pay for, I'm just giving a silly example. If I have to pay 20 bucks for supplies to make some candles, right? I have to pay 20 bucks to get all the supplies. And then I make them and then I sell them for five bucks each. And I have about, you know, 15 of them, right? My revenue is going to come from however many I sold times five, right? That'll give you my revenue. And my cost is 20 bucks, right? Isn't that what it cost me? So how many of those candles would I have to, to sell in order to just break even, 
basically make my money back that I invested. I'd have to sell four of them if I'm selling them at five bucks, right? And then anything above that four would be my profit, okay? So you're gonna see some equations surface. Uh, one of them is for revenue. And it's basically the price times the units sold. So my price was five bucks. I sold four of them. I had $20 in revenue, right? The profit though is going to be your revenue minus your cost. So as soon as I sell more than four candles, now I'm starting to make profit, right? I already paid myself back the 20 bucks I invested and now I'm making the profit, okay? So you're gonna see these equations happen when the revenue equals the cost that's the break-even point, okay? You're gonna see some of these things pop up though, okay? Now, the cost has another equation and I'm gonna actually go down here instead of writing it up here. But the cost has its, its own equation, okay? There's an initial cost, like the rent you have to pay on the building, the, the monies you had to pay for um, supplies, but then there might also be a cost that has that occurs per unit. So like I might need so much amount of wax to make one candle. Well, how much does that one little bit of wax cost, right? That's the cost per unit to make each one, okay? So I'm gonna need a stove and all this other stuff to boil the wax and everything, right? That would be this initial cost. And then the wax and the wickers themselves would be like the cost per unit. Make sense? Okay. So if you want to find the actual complete total cost that it costs you, you're going to want to use this formula. You're going to take the cost per unit times however many units you're making, and then your initial cost. So here they give us a situation. It says a shoe company invests $300,000 in equipment to produce a new line of athletic footwear. Each pair of shoes costs $5 to produce and is sold for $60. How many pairs of shoes must be sold before the business breaks even? So they put a whole bunch of money down just to get the equipment, right? So that's this. But then the materials and possibly even the labor to make each um, pair of shoes is going to cost $5 per pair of shoe, okay? But we don't know how many units we have to sell yet. So they just put an X for that, okay? Because you don't know how many units you're selling just yet. Then of course there's that little formula again that I had where your revenue is the price per unit times the number of units. So it did say that they sold for 60 bucks, right? So since the shoes sell for $60, that's gonna be our price per unit. But again, we don't know how many units are selling just yet. That was what they asked us to find out, right? They said, how many shoes do you have to sell before you break even? Well, remember to break even is when your revenue equals your cost. So if you've got these two formulas, and this actually should be an R, not a C. Um, oh, I see what they did. They know that R needs to equal C. So instead of writing R equal to 60X, they wrote C equals to 60X, but I'm gonna leave it like that. If I wanna take R equal to C, then what you're doing is you're taking this expression and equaling it to the other expression. Okay. So I don't change the variable whenever I do the problem. I just use the expression for R and the expression for C. And then I solve this equation, which is exactly what they did down there. So why they change the variables, I don't know. So they minus 5X on both sides. So they got 55X and then they divided by 55 and they ended up with this number. So this is apparently about the number that you have to solve that you have to sell in order to break even, okay? That's a lot of shoots. Okay, another way to view the solution, for example, four is to consider the profit function, right? So you take the money you make minus the cost that you put in, but when this is zero, isn't it the same thing as the break even point? right? When your profit is zero, like you didn't make nothing, but you don't owe anything either, right? That's the break-even point. Okay, 
So that's enough about the word problems. I do have some practice problems in here for us to work on. We have three. Uh, yes, we have three before we go into the next section. And then I wanna do two more from the homework, okay? So let's go ahead and look at practice one. So practice one has this one. And we're gonna solve this. So pick an equation and then pick a letter. So which equation do you want me to work with? The top or the bottom? Okay, the bottom. Now, which letter do you want me to get by itself? The Y, okay. So then that means I'm gonna have to add X. So I get Y equal to what? Just X, zero plus X is just X. Now this expression is going to get plugged into the other equation for y. So it becomes 3x plus, and instead of the y, what am I plugging in? An x. And then I really don't need these parentheses because there's no powers and there's no coefficient in the front. So I really don't need that parentheses there. I can combine and then I can solve. And since you already have y equals something or another, right? You're gonna plug this back into what you did at the beginning. So I get y equal to three. So what is the solution? Three for x and three for y. And you can always check it. I like to just check it visually. It's not like actually write it out. But three times three is nine plus another three is 12, right? And then negative three plus three, isn't that zero? So it does check out, okay? I just do it in my head, not write it all out on the paper. Oh, it says check your solutions graphically. I'm gonna let the paper do that. Oh no, it's not, this is a practice problem. Let's check the solutions graphically since it says that. And I think in WebAssign you actually have to graph. So if I take this equation, and I'm gonna actually graph it over there on that graph paper. So when I upload the, I'll draw it on here, but I'm gonna go draw it over there because that's better graph paper. So, cause it has to align. If it doesn't align right, then you won't get the actual spot three, three, okay? So if I draw it on paper, it's probably not gonna land like right on three, three. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna do it on the graph paper up there. When I post the notes later, I'll take a picture of that and add it in to the file, okay? Um, but this one, if I wanna graph it, I'm gonna have to minus three X. And so I get negative three X and a positive 12. Over here, I'm gonna have to add the X and I get Y equals to X. Now I'm gonna try to draw it over here, but again, like I said, it's not gonna be perfect. Okay, so when I do y equal to x, zero and zero would be a point, one and one, two and two, three and three, what is this? One, two, three, four, five and five would be about right there. So you can see kind of what this line looks like. And I ran into a little hole over there in my paper. But that's the line y equals x. Now this other line has a y-intercept of 12, but then it has a slope of negative three over one, which means I'm gonna go down three and then over one. And I can keep doing that. One, two, three, and over one. One, two, three, and over one. And see, I'm not on graph paper, so it doesn't look like it's landing there. But apparently they do intersect right here at the point three comma three, okay? Like I said, it doesn't match there, right? But if I take this one,
And then it's going down one, two, three, and over one, one, two, three, and one, one, two, three, and over one. So you see how that one should be right. And it does rhyme, right? But on mine, of course, it's off. So I'm not using rhyme. Okay. Now in web assign, it will ask you to draw it. So you only need two points in order to draw the line. You pick the line button and then you put one point where you need it, put the other point where you need it, and then it'll draw the line for you. Okay. And then when you draw the other line, it'll actually already show you where the solution is and you just type in the solution. Okay. So this one says solve the system using the substitution and then you could check your answers graphically. So I'll probably just try to do it on the paper instead of having to go up there, but hopefully it makes some sense. Oh gosh. If I'm solving by substitution, which equation should I be working with? The top equation or the bottom? Yes, stay away from the X squared, right? You don't want to mess with that one. Just stay away from that one. So we're going to work with the bottom, but which letter do you want to solve for? Solve for X. Okay, so I'm going to have to add Y then. And I'm going to put the positive Y in the front and the minus 5 in the back. And then I'm going to still have to divide by negative 1. So now X is by itself, but the Y is negative and the five is positive. And this is going to get plugged in to the other equation for X. So that means I will have negative Y plus five squared minus Y equal to negative three. And now here I do need the parentheses, right? Because you've got that square there. So it means to multiply it times itself. Don't forget that it means to multiply it times itself. You can never, ever, ever square each term individually. You're going to be missing somebody, okay, if you do that. So let's FOIL this. We get positive y squared, negative 5y, and then distribute that one, negative 5y and positive 25. So see these two guys, they don't cancel each other out, do they? They're both negative. So they don't cancel. And if you just do this incorrectly and you square each one, you're only going to get these two terms and not this term in the middle. Okay, so make sure that you actually foil that out. Now I do have y squared, but I have negative 5, negative 5, and negative 1. So I have negative 11 y's. And what kind of equation is this? Quadratic. So we do need to get it equal to zero. Now, I don't, I usually take a shot whenever there's no number at the front. The other one had a three in the front, right? I didn't even bother trying to factor that one. This one does not have a number in front. And it's usually a lot easier to factor when they don't have that number. So I'm pretty sure we could factor this. It's probably seven and four. But in order to get negative 11, they both have to be negative, right? So I'll get the positive 28 when I multiply and I'll get the negative 11 when I add. So then that means Y equals a positive seven and a positive four, right? If I say each one equal to zero. Now that's the Y values. Both of them are y values, right? So let's plug each of them into here to figure out the corresponding x's. So for the first one, we're going to do negative 7 plus 5. And then for the other one, we're going to do negative 4 plus 5. So then what's going to be the point or the solution for the first, the first solution? negative two for X and seven for Y. What about this solution? One for X and four for Y, because four was what I plugged in, right? 
So this one had two answers here. I'm gonna try to draw it because it does say to check your answers by drawing it. So I'm gonna try, but I need to fix these equations before I do that. They always have to be y equals in order for me to do this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna minus the x squared. I get negative y equals negative x squared minus three. And then if I divide everybody by a negative one, I get y equals positive x squared and positive three. Over here, I'm gonna add the x. I get negative y equals positive x and a negative five, and then divide by the negative one. I get negative x and a positive five. So let's see what that looks like when I try to draw it. I'm gonna try. Just bear with me. Okay, so for the line, we have a y intercept of one, two, three, four, five. And then the slope is negative one over one. So that means I'm going to go down one and over one down one and over one, down one and over one. And I'm just gonna keep doing this until I get far enough, down one and over one. So it is a line that goes in this direction. Again, it's not perfectly flat, right? Because I'm drawing on my paper, not on a graph paper. Now, this one has a y-intercept of three, and then it opens up like a parabola. So one and one, one and one. So it does go this way. And then I would keep going in that direction. So where are the two points of intersection? There's one about here, and then there's one about here, right? Now again, this is off because I'm using graphing paper not using graphing paper, but negative two and seven is about right here. So it's actually right there where they cross. But mine's off because I'm not using graph paper, right? And then the other solution is here at one and four. That one was easier to see. But that's it, just confirm with the graphing thing. Okay, let's look at our first word problem. These other two that I picked out are word problems also. So it says, use a system of equations to find the dimensions of a rectangle meeting the specific conditions. So one is that the perimeter is 84 inches and the width is three fourths the length. So how do you find the perimeter? You have to do two of the lengths plus two of the widths, basically adding up all your sides, right? And that's how you get the perimeter 84. Right, this is my length, this is my width. Is that right? Okay. The second sentence says that the width is three-fourths the length. That means three-fourths times the length. L is length, right? Now, I like to use W and L just because it helps me to you know, write it all out. Not only that is once I've solved for the certain letter, I know which one it is, right? Whereas you might see in the computer that they use X and Y a lot, and that's fine to use X and Y, but then how do you remember X was which one? X was the width or X was the length, right? And so I just like to use W's and L's, but if you go on a computer, they probably use X and Y, okay? So do I need to do anything for step one? Or is that bottom equation already ready to go? It already has one letter all by itself, doesn't it? So I don't even need to do step one. I can just take this expression and plug it into the top equation. So I get two L plus two, and instead of W, I'm gonna write the three fourths L. 
And so then if I multiply that, I actually get six force L, right? This is like a two over one. So two times three is six, one times four is still a four. But how do you get rid of fractions if you don't like them? Multiply everybody by that denominator, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do four over here, four over here, and four over there. I end up with eight L, these go out six L and whatever 84 times four is. Three, three, six. I can combine my L's to get 14 L and then just divide by 14. And I get 24. Now, if I wanna figure out the width, I go back to that. So the width is three fourths times 24, which is actually, I think, 18. Let me go make sure. Three fourths times 24, yes, 18. And so then now I actually know which letter goes in which box, right? Because it says the width is the 18 and the length is the 24, okay? So you have both of those measurements already. Okay, now I have to go to the computer. So bear with me, I'm gonna go grab number 10 just to see what it looks like. Um, and then number 13 I wanna do as well. And then we'll go to 9.2, but once we hit 940, that we're gonna stop with 9.2. If we get to all of it, fantastic. If we don't, we'll continue 9.2 tomorrow. Okay, I did schedule it that way because I wasn't sure if we would have enough time to cover the whole 9.2. Oh my goodness, come on computer. Let's see if I can get there faster. It's still loading. Oh, oh, I might get there faster. Just an FYI, I did re open all of the old homework, right? So the unit four stuff, if you didn't get a chance to get to all of it, it is still open now and everything still has that date of the seventh. Why did I choose the seventh? Anybody know why I chose the seventh? That's it for us, yeah. Cause your final's on the seventh. After that, no mas, no more stuff. Stop giving me stuff, right? <laughs> I've got to grade everything and I've got to calculate all of your scores, okay? So on the seventh is that cutoff. You could still show up to take the final in the morning and then go do some more homework stuff if you want to, right? But that night on the seventh, it's all gonna cut off, okay? And that's for both the face-to-face -face class and the online class, both of them. Everything shuts down on the seventh. We'll take your other finals, right? <laughs> okay, so let's see, fill in the blank system. Oh, it has all the answers, <laughs> oh well. Let's go back down to number 10. So this problem here, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm just gonna write down the bits of info, okay? So for number 10, um, we have the annual interest is 680. And then we have rate one, is 5%, rate two is 7%. Um, the amount of annual interest earned from a total of 11,000 invested. So if it's invested, that's my P. P is my investment. So P is equal to this $11,000. 
is invested in two funds paying simple interest. Okay, simple interest is important. That means we're not doing the PERT junk that we learned in the last section. And we're not doing the, um, the other one, the one that had the one plus the R over N and NT power, all that craziness. No, we're not doing that. I did not know this thing was touch screen. What the heck? Okay, <laughs> just simple interest. Simple interest just means your rate times your time times the money you put in. All of those three, okay? I'll write it down in a minute. Um, it says write and solve a systems of equations to find the amount invested at each given rate, okay? And so I have the answers there, but let's go figure out how they got them. All I did was write down the info, right? I haven't written down anything else. Because it said simple interest, you have to remember the old way we calculated interest, which was to take the principal times the rate times the time. And that's it, just straight multiply them, okay? So let's set up our two equations then. We've got the first interest, which can be found by taking, um, actually there's gonna be three equations here, interesting. So we'll put it together. So interest one is what I'm gonna call this. Is found by taking the, I don't know how much, dang. I don't know how much was invested at the first rate. So let's assign variables. I'm gonna say X equals the amount at 5%. And then I'm gonna say Y is gonna be the amount invested at the 7%. Okay, so I'm labeling my variables that way when I get my answers, I know what they represent. Okay, super important that you label them so that when you do have X and Y, you remember which one goes with which. Okay, so I don't know how much I'm investing in for the first interest, so I'm just going to use the X. Okay, but the rate for the X is going to be the 0.5. So it's actually going to be 0 0.05. Don't we always have to change those percentages to decimals? And then the time, did it tell me time? It did not tell me time. So it really doesn't matter, but I'm going to put just T, I guess. I can't put T. Are we sure it didn't tell me time? Yes, thank you. I was like looking for it. I was like, they had to tell me time. But annual means how much year has passed. Just one year. So then I am going to choose just one for time. So let me write that down. The annual was our clue that the time equaled one. Then the second interest can be found by taking the other amount and its interest rate, which was 0 0.07, but it's still an annual year, so just one for T. And then the last equation is the total investment. So the total interest that I earned, didn't it tell me what the total interest was? So I know that once I know this guy's interest and I know this guy's interest, I can calculate together and just give you 680 interest, okay? Before I go on, I'm gonna clean these up. So if I multiply all this together, it's just 0.05X. And if I multiply all of this together, it's 0.07Y. Um, and there's actually another equation in here. This one's very interesting. I drew my little thing too short. There's one more equation in here. One more equation. It says my total investment is 11,000, doesn't it? Which means however much money I put in that first account, plus however much I put in that second account should equal the $11,000. So there's another equation. 
Now here's what we're gonna do. We're going to shrink this into just two equations. I can put all three of these together. All three of them. All it's gonna be is instead of writing I1 plus I2, I'm gonna write 0.05x plus 0.07y. That's I1, that's I2. And if I add them together, I should be getting 680, right? So I just combined all three of these into one full equation. And then the bottom is still X plus Y equal to 11,000. Now, which one of these looks the easiest to start doing all the substitution? Definitely not the top one, right? The top one's got all the decimals in it and everything, right? We don't wanna touch that one. If we mess with the bottom one, which letter do you wanna get by itself? Because both of them are the same level of difficulty or the same level of easiness. Which letter do you wanna get by itself? X, okay, so we'll minus the Y, which means X will equal 11,000 minus Y. And then this expression will replace the X because it's saying X equals this, right? So what is that gonna look like? 0 0.05 times 11,000 minus Y and then the rest of the equation. So what's the first thing I have to do to solve this thing? Mm -hmm. So I get 550 and here I get 0.05y. And if I combine those y's, I'm actually going to get a 0.02y because this one was negative, right? So I actually subtract. Now it is linear, so I just can keep solving. And that is positive, so I don't need to put the plus in the front. Um, what is that, 130? And then the last step is to divide. And so let's see, 130 divided by 0 0.02, I get 6500. Zero, zero. So that's one number. I can take this number and plug it into here to get the X. So X equals 11,000 minus the 6,500. One, two, three, minus 6,500. And I get the 4,500. Now remember which one's which. I have it at the top in pink, right? I'm gonna zoom out just so that you could see everything, hopefully. Let me move that guy out of the way. There we go. So we do have 6,500 6, for Y and we have 4,500 for X. Now, when you have to type it in the computer, make sure that 4,500 X is the one that goes for the 5%, right? And Y, which was 6,500 is the amount that goes in at the 7%, okay? Because you do have those two boxes. So make sure you're putting them in the correct boxes, okay? That one was interesting though. So I wanted to definitely do it before <laughs> you saw it on the, on the homework and had to do it by yourself. Okay, the other one that I wanted to do that stuck out to me was number 13. So I'm gonna go grab that information and see what that looks like. So this number 12 is a lot like the one that we did, right? but we haven't done one like number 13. So number 13 says, what are the dimensions of a rectangular tract of land when its perimeter is 54 kilometers and its area is 180 square kilometers? So let me write that down, 9.1 number 13. 
And we've got that perimeter is 54 kilometers and area is 180 square kilometers. And it is a rectangular track. So this is what I came up with. That's all I got. Okay, I drew a rectangle and put W and L, right? Now we have to remember the formulas for how we calculate perimeter and area. For perimeter, we have to do add up the two links, add up the two widths, and that's how we'll get the 54 kilometers, right? For the area, we have to take the length times the width in order to get that 180 area. And this one's not as complicated as another problem. It's those are the two equations you gotta solve, right? So which one of those do you wanna solve for? They're both the same level of difficulty because one's gonna give you, you might be able to avoid fractions if you solve the top one. The bottom one will give you a fraction, but there's nothing wrong with fractions. You just multiply by the common denominators later anyway, right? So it's not that big of a deal. If this was an odd number, would I be able to divide by two? I'd have a fraction either way, right? Okay, but it is even, so I can divide by two. So you might be inclined to take the top one, okay? Let's go with the top one. Which letter do you wanna solve for, L or W? W, so that means I'm gonna have to minus the two L over. So I have positive two W equal to 54 minus the two L. Then how do I get W completely by itself? Mm -hmm. So I gotta divide every single term by two. And it does divide, I just don't know what it is, uh, 27. Now that you have the W all by itself, you're gonna take that expression and you're gonna plug it in for W. So this becomes L times 27 minus L equal to 108. And where do I go from here? Distribute. And then what kind of equation is this now? Quadratic. Now, do I wanna move the 180 to the left or do I wanna move those two guys to the right? Why do you wanna move these two guys to the right? Correct, you don't want your squared guy negative, okay? If he was positive, I'd move this one over here. It's one less guy to move, right? But because it's negative, we wanna move everybody over there. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna put these in the correct order. So I'm gonna put the L squared first, then the regular Ls, and then the constant positive 180. Now that might, 30 and let me see, 180 divided by 30 is six. 30 and six is not gonna give me 27. 180 divided by 15. Ah, that does give me, okay. So look, I got, I did 180 by 15 and I got 12. Doesn't 15 and 12 give me 27, right? If you can't factor it, just do quadratic formula. You'll get the same two answers, but I'm gonna factor it into minus 15 and minus 12. Those add to give me negative 27. And when I multiply them, I get the positive 180, okay? So then my L equals 15 or my L equals 12, right? We have two plausible answers. Aren't they both positive? Right? It's not like one of them is negative and that just doesn't make any sense, right? Your length cannot be negative. They're both positive. So they both could be the answers. Let's go figure out what the W's would have to be that correspond. So W is 27 minus L, which means W would have to be 12 in this case. And over here, 27 minus 12 gives me the 15. Which one of these does not make sense? The left one or the right one? One of them is bad. Tell me which one of these do not make sense and why? W. 
they're both going to check out, but one of them just logically does not make sense. Can we tell you? <laughs> you give up. <laughs> this one is the bad one. Can your width or should your width be bigger than your length? Isn't your length supposed to, by definition, supposed to be the longer one, right? So this width is bigger than the length, which is why this one doesn't plausibly make sense, okay? You get the same two answers, but this is the one with the correct labels, okay? You want to call the longer side your length and the shorter side your width, okay? So this is going to be your answer. That's the only reason. It's just because the length should be the longer one, okay? So be careful there, because if you do put them in the wrong boxes, it might give it to you wrong. But I think on this one, they just asked us a comma. Let me go verify. Yeah, see, they just asked you what are the, because they knew <laughs> that that was going to happen. So you just type them both in there. And it really wouldn't have mattered if I typed 15 first and then 12. It still would have been the same thing. Okay. Okay, so we've got two methods and we got about 20 more minutes. I think I can talk to you a little bit about this one. Um, we just might not be able to practice, you know, everything. But for the next section, we're going to actually talk about 9.2 now. And in 9.2, we're actually finally going to talk about this um, elimination method. Okay. Now, elimination method only works with linear problems. If you get nonlinear problems like this problem right here, that's not linear because it's got a times in there, okay? So as soon as you have a times or a square or something else going on between your two letters, it's not a linear anymore and you cannot do it this way, okay? This way is only for linear equations. Equations is that if you can somehow get your two equations to have the same number in front, but with opposite signs, what happens when you add them together? Won't these guys cancel? And then you'll have three Y and then you'll have six, right? And then that you can solve for Y and then go back into one of the equations and figure out X, okay? So that is the goal. The goal is to cancel one of the variables, okay? <clears throat> so that you can eliminate it, right? Or some words. So this is the process. They try to explain it as best as they can, but it, it, you really have to look at what you've got and then make decisions, okay? So the idea is, is you want to obtain coefficients for X or Y. You'd have to pick one first, pick a letter, and then work to try to get that letter to go away. You make it go away by having the same coefficients, but differing in sign, okay? Now you do that by multiplying all the terms in one of the equations, or if you have to multiply all the terms in both equations by certain numbers, okay? <coughs> I'll show you the trick on how to do it, but we'll get there. Once you add those two results together, it should cross out one of the variables because if they have the same number but opposite signs, when you add them together, shouldn't they wipe away, right? Um, so those should cross out. Then you'll solve whatever you have left over. And then once you have that answer, you plug that answer into any one of the two equations because you never took one and isolated something, right? You didn't do that. So when you get your first answer, you can plug it in wherever you want, either the top equation or the bottom equation, and then solve for the other variable, okay? So here's an example, and they're taking this equation here. Now, I'm going to explain to you why they choose what they choose to do, but it is not the only choice, okay? They noticed that the y's already have opposite signs, don't they? One already has a plus and one already has a minus. And so then for them, they're like, well, let's go with that one then. Let's try to eliminate the y's since they already differ in sign. However, I need to make sure that the bottom one also has a four in front of it, right? So what they're gonna do is they're gonna multiply the equation two by four. So when they do that, equation two, this bottom one, will turn in, the top one stays exactly the same. The bottom one, when you multiply every single person at the bottom by four, 
it turns into this equation, right? You're gonna multiply everybody in the bottom equation by four. When you do that, these now match and they're opposite signs. So when you add everything together or you combine the two together, these will wipe out, but 2x combined with 20x makes 22x and negative seven combined with negative four makes negative 11, right? Then you would solve this puppy for x by dividing by 22. And when they reduced, they got negative one half. Then they decided to plug the negative one half back into equation one. I could have also plugged it into equation two. It doesn't matter. They chose to put it in equation one, fantastic. I personally would not have plugged it into equation one. I would have plugged it into, I would have plugged it into this one actually. I would have done five times negative one half plus y equal to negative one. This would have been negative five halves and then I would have added five halves and I would have still gotten the positive three halves that they have. Negative one plus five halves is mean three halves. And isn't that what they got when they plugged it into the other equation? Okay, so it does not matter which one you plug your answer in. Once you have that answer, pick one, plug it in and go find the other letter, okay? Now that I know both letters, I just have to remember the X number goes in the front and the Y number goes in the back, right? So the X number was the negative one half and then the Y value was the three halves, okay? Now, could I have solved this equation by eliminating X? The answer is yes. And we're gonna do it. If I took this equation and I wanted to eliminate X, I'd have to make both of them have the same number in front, but with opposite signs. And there's no one way to do this. I'm still gonna have a choice between two different options. The only way for me to make them have the same number is kind of like the common denominator business. I'm gonna have to multiply this equation by a five and I'm gonna have to multiply this equation by a two. Notice that I swapped the coefficients, right? Because when I multiply those, I'll get 10X. And when I multiply these, I'll get 10X, won't I? So the numbers will match, okay? There's one problem though. I'm supposed to make them have opposite signs and they don't, do they? Which means one of these guys has to be negative, okay? And that's what I meant by there's still a choice here, which one you wanna do. Do you wanna use a negative five or do you wanna do a negative two? Only one of them can be negative. Pick one, the top or the bottom? Bottom, okay, so we'll do negative two times the bottom one and just positive five times the top one. So it turns into, this would be 10X, this would be negative 20Y and this would be negative 35. And the bottom, when I multiply that, it's gonna be negative 10X. That's gonna be negative two Y. And then this is gonna turn into a positive two. What do we get here? This goes away. We get negative 22 Y and we get negative 33. If I divide by negative 22, the negatives cancel. And if I reduce both of these by 11, I get three halves. Isn't that the same Y value we got last time, right? And you can take that Y value and plug it into any one of these two. I'm gonna plug it in the bottom one so I don't have to multiply it by four. Does that make sense? There's no other reason why I'm picking the bottom one. It's just, I don't wanna have to multiply it. So I'm gonna take five X plus this three halves equal to the negative one. So I'm gonna minus my three halves and I get five X equal to, it should be negative five halves, but I'll go make sure. Negative one minus three halves. And then I'm gonna have to divide by five, aren't I? So divide by five and I get negative one half. Isn't that what we got the other time? So it literally doesn't matter. There's gonna be like gobs of ways you could do these problems. You could have, somebody could have chose to eliminate X when another person could have chose to eliminate Y. And then once you had one of your answers, 
One person might have chose to plug it into the first equation and the other person might have chose to plug it into the second equation. It doesn't matter. So all the else problems are gonna look different just depending on your decisions, okay? But you can all still get the correct answer, okay? That's the important part, not your, I always call there's like rules and then there's style, right? Your style is like all the choices you do. As long as you don't break any of the rules, you're good. You could do whatever you want to do with these things, okay? That reminded me of some, somebody's had a thing on Facebook and it said like, tell us what you do for a living without telling us what you do for a living. And I said, I help 20 year olds find their exes. <laughs> I don't know if anybody got it, but that was what I had said. So I think they're just going over all of the details. This I want to mention because this is going to come back to us in chapter 10. So notice that they say you can interchange any two equations. Does it matter whether you write equation one on the top and equation two at the bottom or the other way around? Does it matter? It's the whole thing. It's just at the bottom or at the top, right? So that's what they mean by you can interchange any two equations. You can swap where they are located, okay? You can multiply any equation by a non-zero constant. So I can multiply by a positive, by a negative, by a fraction, by a decimal, whatever the heck I want, right? You can multiply any equation. You can multiply both of them if you want to. Then you can also add a multiple of one equation to another equation. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a multiple either. You can just multiply, I mean, add them together straight at the beginning, as long as those coefficients are the same. The reason why I'm mentioning these three is because when you get to matrices, these are literally the same three rules that you can do with matrices, okay? So when we get to a matrix, it's gonna say you can interchange any two rows of that matrix, you can multiply any row by a non-zero number, and then you can add any two rows together and then replace one of those rows, okay? That's gonna get a little bit tricky on which one gets replaced, but we'll talk about it when we get to chapter 10. Okay, um, here is the graphical interpretation. So remember, if the lines, whatever the lines are, if they intersect at one point, then you have one solution. If the two lines are the exact same line, meaning that they land right on top of each other when you graph them, then those have an infinitely number of solutions because don't they touch each other or intersect each other everywhere along that line, right? And there's it's got arrows on it. There's an infinite number of points on that line. So that's why they say there's infinitely many solutions when they're the exact same line, okay? So you graph one, you graph the other, and it's right on top, okay? Then the other situation is if like the lines are parallel. If the lines are parallel like a train track, they're never going to cross and touch each other ever. And so in that kind of situation, you have no solution. Okay. We talked about how it could happen with the parabola and the line, but it can also happen with two lines. If they just run right along each other, they're never going to cross, right? Okay. Now... What is this? Oh, that's the back side of that paper. So here's the thing. There's some words here that we have to learn. It says a system of linear equations is considered consistent when it has at least one solution. That means is that you are consistent when you have one solution or infinitely many solutions. Okay, so both of those situations the system is called consistent. Now, inconsistent is when there's no solution. Okay, so they've got some names here. Now, here's some more names. It's going to be even more confusing. Um, when the system has exactly one solution, it's called independent. Whereas with a system with infinitely many solutions is dependent, okay? So there's two labels here, consistent and inconsistent, and then dependent and independent. And I'm gonna show you the three cases. So let's say 
you have two lines, right? And they intersect right there, right? They do have a solution, don't they? So it is called consistent. But because they have just one solution, it's called independent. Just that one. Now, when you have parallel lines though, those do not ever cross, do they? So this is called inconsistent. And there's no solution. So you don't call it independent or dependent at all. It's just inconsistent, period. Okay, there's no solution here. I call it independent and I'll explain to you why. Isn't this two different lines? Two different equations, right? It's called independent. Aren't these two different lines? That's why I call them independent. Now, if you've got one line and then the other one right on top of it, that one is called consistent because it does touch. Don't they two things touch? But it's called dependent because it is not the same, it's not different lines. It's the same line, okay? So two different lines is called independent. The same line is called dependent. And if they touch, it's consistent. And if they don't touch like the train tracks, it's called inconsistent. Because you might have some vocabulary stuff with that. I can't remember. I think it's on this tab. I could have sworn there's one on the final that has to do with those labels, OK? So you've got to get those um, that wording down. Now, of course, they give us these things. It says, match each system of linear equations with its graph, describe the number of solutions, and then state whether the system is consistent or inconsistent. So, I don't know. Notice that this numbers are multiplied by two, right? Actually multiplied by negative two. That's negative two, negative two, but is this multiplied by negative two? No, right? So they're not the same equation. Now here I can multiply by two, but that's not multiplied by two. So those are not the same equation. Now here, if I multiply by negative two and I multiply by negative two and I multiply by negative two, are these the same? They are. If I were to divide all of these guys by negative two, I would literally get positive two X, negative three Y and a positive three. And that's the exact same equation as the top one, right? So C is going to match this one. Oops, not that one. Because it's just one graph with one line and they're on top of each other, okay? This one is called consistent. I cannot spell these words. And how many solutions does it have? infinity many it touches it everywhere right okay now let's look at the other one let's see hmm i think these two will have the same slope aren't these multipliers right but this one wasn't right if I take this equation and I try to find the slope, I'm going to have to minus 2x on both sides. And then I'm going to have to divide by negative 3. And so I get the equation y equals positive 2 thirds x minus 1. So far, you good? with what I did there. I'm just getting the Y by itself. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go look at the other one. So negative four X plus six Y equal to six. I'm gonna add the four X over. I get positive six Y equal to four X plus six. I'm gonna divide by six and I get Y equals, that reduces to two thirds and plus one. So they do have the same slope, don't they? They just have different y-intercepts. This, this one's got the positive one y-intercept, 
And this one's got the negative one y-intercept, but they have the exact same slope, right? So this is going to be A because I was manipulating those equations, right? And then is this consistent or inconsistent? Does it cross? It does not cross, so it's inconsistent. And how many solutions does it have? None, no solutions. And then by process of elimination, that leaves us with the last one, right? But this one will be B. Is it consistent or inconsistent? Do they cross or touch? They do, so it's consistent. And then how many solutions does it have? Just one solution. And it's that point right there where they cross, right? So just working on your vocabulary and being able to tell. The easiest way is to look at those slopes and those y-intercepts. Um, they're just saying what I said, but in words. Okay, applications. It says, at this point, you may be asking the question, how can I tell which application problems can be solved using linear systems of linear equations? The answer comes from the following considerations. Does the problem involve more than one unknown quantity? If it does, you should be able to use a system. Are there two or more equations or conditions that can be satisfied? In order for it to be a system, there does have to be at least two right equations. Um, if the answer is to one or both of these questions is yes, then the appropriate model for the problem may be a system of linear equations. So you do have to have at least two unknowns and at least two equations. You could have three unknowns and three equations, but you need at least two. Oh, this is my example. Okay, so it says an airplane flying into a headwind. So this one isn't the train one, but it's a plane one. It's the same stupid thing. So airplane flying into a headwind travels 2,000 miles flying distance between Chicopee, Massachusetts, I've never heard that city before, and Salt Lake City, Utah, in four hours and 24 minutes. On the return flight, the airplane travels the distance in four hours. Find the airspeed of the plane and the speed of the wind, assuming that, excuse me, that both remain constant. Okay. need some formulas here. We need to know that the distance, <clears throat> excuse me, and I might have written this already before, is the rate, which is another word for speed, times the time. You definitely have to know that, okay? Now, there's two things that are gonna happen when you're talking about if you're if you're doing the train, the train usually doesn't have this consideration of the wind. Okay. But when you're talking about airplanes, there is a wind that's blowing in a certain direction. So either either help your plane move faster if you're going in the same direction as the wind, or it'll slow you down if you're going against that wind, right? If you're traveling the opposite direction that the wind is blowing. So that's gonna affect our speed a little bit. The other situation that is very similar to the air and wind thing is a river or usually it's a river, okay? Because in a river, the water flows, right? And if you're trying to go downstream, you're running with the water and you're gonna swim a little lot faster, right? Or your boat's gonna go a whole lot faster. Whereas if you're going up the current, it's gonna slow you down, right? You're pushing against all that water fighting you. And so it's going to slow down your boat or slow down the swimmer. So those two do have a lot of correlation. So you might see the boat problem in the home, but it's the same thing as the airplane problem. Okay. Um, so how do I do this? The time, I definitely need to have that in hours. So let's see, 24 minutes divided by 60 minutes. So this is actually 4.4 .4 hours. 
And then that one's just four hours, right? Now you do have two different travel needs, okay? So I'm gonna go to the bottom just because it's gonna explain all the wind stuff, okay? Now, when you're going against the wind or against the current of the water, you're always gonna subtract the speed of the wind or the speed of the water, okay? Then if you're going with the wind or with the current, it's gonna make you go faster, isn't it? So you're gonna add that speed of the wind or that speed of the current. Okay, so you have your original rate, R1 is the speed of the actual plane, and that doesn't change. But depending on whether you're going with the wind or against the wind, that will tell you whether you're adding or subtracting that second number. Now, I've already run out of time, though, so I'm going to stop, and I'm going to start here when we come back tomorrow. Okay, we'll continue here. I didn't look at my clock, and I didn't realize that I ran out of time. Um, 